Hello, welcome back to the restoration couple and the van conversion. Today's video is going to be all about wall insulation. So one of the really key parts of any build, whether it's a house or a van or whatever, is the insulation, you know, the ability to keep something warm or cold. Uh, and there's a few uh, problems that can occur if you don't do this right. The principles from, you know, the house renovation and building uh, sort of science can be brought into the van really. So I'm sure this video will attract positive and negative comments as always. Uh, but I don't know what everyone's fascination is with insulation in vans and simply horrendous uh, insulations that are out there in the public eye. But um, I'm going to try and justify everything I'm doing and although there's so many different routes you can go, I'll kind of explain why we're doing it this way. So let's treat this skin, of you know, this metal skin of the van as our uh, building wall. You know, so it could be the same as a brick wall or a concrete wall or whatever. It, it is our outside skin of the van and it's going to be cold. I'm going to be dealing with cold uh, temperatures we're insulating to keep the van warm. Okay, that, that's the, how I'm going to explain this. It kind of reverses itself anyway. But in effect, this is very, very cold and your warm, moist air from inside a house or in this case in the van will condense on that just like it does on a mirror in a bathroom or a single glazed window in a house. Um, and it's all well and good saying, oh, it's going to be dry in here, but it's not, you know, humans are wet <laughs> people, you know, it, it's just the evaporation from our skin, from our cooking, from whatever, it's, it's always going to be in the air. So, whereas in a house, sometimes you can have a breathable makeup, like we obviously we've done in our old house, you can't have that in a van. I see loads of instances where people are like, oh, we'll just leave it, we don't need a vapour barrier, we'll leave it open so it can breathe and it can dry. Well. In theory, that could be right. You know, if you just had a, a load of pallet wood banged on the wall and your insulation stuffed in there, then your warm, moist air, you know, this is breathable. Stuff will get through this. Um, and your warm, moist air will still condense on there. And the argument is that it'll dry out and come back out. But in theory, it's already condensed. It'll already start dripping down. In some vans, that'll cause rust. In others, you know, you could end up with mold and stuff building up in there. It's simply, it's not like a cavity in a wall or where you've got lime and stonework and it can breathe out the other side. It can't go beyond it. So breathable, a breathable makeup doesn't really make too much sense. So of course you could argue that if you just use foam like we did on the ceiling, that that is vapor tight. And it is, that foil, that's why we've taped it all, that is a vapor barrier. Um, but if you don't install that correctly, it can still get through and it'll get behind there and that's even worse almost because it will be trapped behind there it's not going to come out very easy so yes if you can put a load of this on you know the foam insulation or xps or something like that on the wall and make sure it's vapor tight that's great i didn't want to use foam and, and sort of um pir insulation everywhere just because you know it's, it's not the most eco of materials to use and while yes, its performance is really high, it's not actually gonna help us too much in this instance. So the widest part of our wall ribs is here and here. And they stick out over, well, about 80 to 90 millimeters. So getting on for four inches. And so we're gonna end up with basically a cavity behind it. Yes, if you were gonna take in the walls back in at this point and then come back out then it might pay to use a uh, foam insulation in here but for the majority of builds you see that they come off the, the narrowest part and they sheet down at that point so most people tend to use 25 or 50 mil so one inch or two inch foam insulation in the walls with the foil face and and actually this sort of soft insulation is you know everything's different uh, all, all products are different but from 100 millimeters of this insulation, I'm basically getting the same, if not slightly better properties than if I'm gonna put regular sheets of one or two inch foam in here. So I'm not losing any U values, R values, whatever you wanna deal with. Uh, I'm still gonna end up with high performance insulation. The problem is this is not vapor barrier. This is not vapor tight itself. 
So of course on the roof, we had the foil boards and we taped over the joins. So we end up with a foil surface, which is a vapor barrier. Vapor barrier just means basically that warm, moist air, the water can't get through it and condense on the cold metal. Uh, we did the same on the floor. Um, so here, if we, if we fill all of these cavities with our lovely warm recycled insulation, we're gonna end up with uh, potential for stuff for moisture to make its way through it and get to the metalwork. So we need a barrier. We could just use um, a, a thin polythene, a vapor check, vapor check layer, or uh, sil silver sort of building foil, which is probably uh, the way I should have gone. I ended up buying that silver bubble wrap, uh, which is like chocolate in the van world. Everyone seems to use it. Most of the time, it seems that they're using it wrong. But um, in, in our instance, we're gonna use it as a vapor barrier. I don't really, I'm not really bothered about its insulation properties. They're pretty negative anyway, you know, pretty neutral. But what it will give us is a silver wall, which will be vapor tight and continue. We can tape it into the ceiling and to the floor, and there is no way that moisture can get to our walls. And in this fan, there is a, a kind of a gutter uh, down by the sill underneath. We can access that from underneath. It's also got rubber bungs in it, so you could, if there was ever any chance of any buildup, you could leave those open and everything would make its way out. I'm gonna keep, leave them in there, but in six months, maybe a year, I'm gonna remove one of them and we'll feed up a humidity meter and we'll just take a recording just to see how dry it is behind here and to make sure there's no humidity buildup in there. Providing all those vapor check barriers go in at, you know, on a sensible dry day when there's no condensation already on here, then it should remain a sealed environment behind there to a certain extent. The last method I haven't mentioned is when you see people using spray foam, expanding foam, not in the canister, I'm talking about the two part, you know, commercial grade stuff. Fine, okay, yeah, that, that will give you your insulation and your barrier at the same time. Uh, Again, it's not a particularly green product and you would need to get everywhere to make it effective. Um, and you've got to trim it all anyway because you're going to need to access all your ribs to attach stuff to. But that is another option some people go to. It's pretty expensive, especially here in the UK. And there are always the worries and concerns about off-gassing. You know, the stuff's got to cure and that could go on for a period of time. So, you know, positives and negatives to that. But that is another option. Lesson over, I'm sure the comments are coming in now, but you know, those sort of theories are what are used in commercial buildings, domestic properties, uh, kind of portable buildings, uh, anything like that. So really you can transfer it to a van. But I've run the vast majority of our wiring so far. There's a little bit uh, to do where the switches will come through the wall, but I can still access that. And I've run some additional conduit in the wall with the intention that in the future, once the walls are finished, I can still pull through cables. I'm thinking like reversing camera in the, in the future. I could just get one of the wireless ones, but if I did want to run a cable to the back, then I can pop it in there, drag it down, and you know, it's easy access. So the very first thing I need to do before I can even start on banging the insulation in, which is probably the quickest part, um, I need to get some mounting battens on these ribs for well attaching the sheets to the wall but also in order to uh, give us something really strong to hang our beds from remember we've got two sofas which essentially are going to form a full-time bed back here kind of a four foot bed so that'd be the double at the bottom and then there'll be a similar sized bed above so it's almost like a double bunk bed and the top one is going to be mounted about here. There'll be brackets that it slots into. So I want to utilize this. I don't know how strong it is. I haven't even checked the specs, but it's only for the kids and it's certainly the strongest part to hang off. So I'm going to secure a batten onto here. I'm going to use bolts for that. Bolt it really tight. We'll also bang a little bit, bit of the uh, Sikaflex adhesive behind there for belts and braces. So we'll have this really strong batten running the length of the van and I'll do that at both heights. That'll give us our fixing point for our plywood, but also it'll, you know, we know that we can bang some really long fixings in there through the plywood, through the batten to give us the strength.
top one I'm going to put in first, that's a slightly wider one. And once I've got the adhesive on the back and the bolts through, I've just had a play around the other side and I can get a spanner in there. I'm just going to need to put a couple of washers on the back just to space it away so I can get a good angle. Uh, but that's fine. And then the ones lower down, I can even I can actually get a whole socket in there and we can tighten them up pretty easily. So I'm using M8 bolts, they're just left over from when I built the polytunnel. Unfortunately, they're about 100 mil long, so uh, I need to chop these down. That's all of our bolts cut, I think there's eight or so there. Um, they're not all of them actually, I'll cut them as I go. Certainly enough for one side. They, uh, the reason why I'm using those is if we were using self-drilling screws, Screws don't tend to have any shear strength, so especially if we're hanging bunks or the overhead cabinets and stuff, I'd rather have something really substantial there. Um, and we just kind of, just peace of mind really. So we're gonna mix that on that one. Should have drilled these first. drilling screws. Good. And that's definitely below the level of the, uh, the surface. And that's pretty solid. And of course you, you could use things like rib nuts or uh, I'm sure there's other ways of doing this. This is a little bit fiddly, but it's pretty basic, and uh, we know the strength's gonna be there now. Especially with the adhesive in there. Now, of course, ideally we'd be wanting to use some nylon nuts here, or shake-proof washers, um, but I've only got them in M12 from when we did the seats. So, uh, that's not ideal, but as I tighten these up, it picks up some of the adhesive off the, um, the back of these. So actually it's not the end of the world because that adhesive is going to hold those nuts fast anyway and it needs a tiny bit on the thread. seats are, nothing will be hanging on that wall, so I'm just going to go with adhesive and the self-tappers for that.
where we can start the actual insulation. Uh, these work pretty well. Not, I'm not sure how important it is that I've done that. Um, I think it, it will help, especially where we've got overhead units, the kitchen units. I know that something is being anchored well to the body, um, but you know, it, it might be that we could have just used ply straight onto the metal work. At least this gives some sort of air gap, bit of a thermal break. But anyway, it's a few hours well spent, I think. <laughs> 